What is good, good people? You are now listening to another episode of Since We Last Spoke with Danny Foxworth. I am your humble narrator, Danny Foxworth. And this is an this has been an episode idea that I've been toying around with the idea of doing for quite some time now. And I was it just a just a little inside baseball. I've been thinking about some of the favorite years of my life and revisiting those years and just doing like a retro like we'll take a year one episode will dedicate to uh, just get providing a retrospective of one particular year and i figure who better to co-pilot this episode than somebody who's was seriously in the mix specific during this specific year and the year i'm talking about is the year 1996 and mm. I'm bringing back friend of the show. You know him. You love him. The great illustrious Twelve Kyle. Twelve Kyle, what's good, bro? Man, what's happening? What's cracking, man? Glad to be back in the building, man. This is looking forward to this, man. Man, absolutely. And I, I'm looking forward to getting your perspective of what was going on in your life during that time period. So we're going to be covering mm -hmm. basically news, like news stories music, entertainment, and what was going on in our personal lives during those time periods as well. So I'm going to start with the year 1996. Just, just mm -hmm. uh, by the numbers, cost of a uh, average uh, cost of monthly rent in 1996 was $554 a month. Cost of a gallon of gas was $1.22. My Lord. That them days ain't coming back, but uh, minimum wage was no. five, minimum wage was five dollars and fifteen cents. So, <laughs> Twelve Kyle, what were you doing mm -hmm. in nineteen ninety six? Man, that's why I, I got to be honest. When you sent this to me, that's one of the reasons why I really perked up because uh, nineteen ninety six was a very special and pivotal year because that was the year that I graduated from college. Uh, graduated from South Carolina State University in 1996, December 14th, to be specific, 1996. Okay. Uh, at that particular time, Danny, I can't lie, man, it was by far the happiest day of my life. Um, <laughs> just being able to go through school and accomplish, you know, and, and, and walk across that stage uh, in Oliver C. Dawson Stadium, where I played football at too, and I, I always say like that was my that was my best move. You know, there was the roar of the crowd that day was something special. It was it was different from you know running on the field or catching a touchdown pass. Um, you know, that day of graduating from South Carolina State was at the time was the happiest day and definitely the probably the proudest day that I had uh, as a human being. So um, yeah, ninety ninety six will always be a great year for me. Dope, dope. So, what was the uh, the the after the uh, after graduation like of like like sport, like <laughs> partying and stuff? Because I know you had I know you had to get that one last party out of you before you left before you left state. Of course, of course. Um, and, and just for you guys listening, watching, uh, I'm a little bit older than Danny, uh, slightly more seasoned than my brother Danny here. But um, you're right, man. We we did party. We partied. There was a party that night um off campus and um you know i i was i was happy to be partying but i was also focused because um i'll let you in on a little secret i had a trip planned the next day i was gonna leave orangeburg where south carolina state is located drive to columbia south carolina and get on a plane and danny i was getting on this plane and i was headed to la and i was going to la to meet the people that I would eventually call my in-laws. Uh, my girls from LA, we were in school together at South Carolina State. She was a couple of years behind me. And, you know, I we had gotten a plan just for me to come out there for Christmas. And I I had been to LA before. I went out for the Super Bowl in, in um, 1987. But this was my first time going to LA as an adult, or at least a young adult. And, um, it, man, it was dope, man. It was really, really dope to go out there and you know, at the time, I didn't know that these people would become my in-laws, but um, me and their daughter had been dating for two years, and it was time. And um, 
I fell in love with LA. Obviously, fell in love with her. Fell in love with LA. Her her parents were really really cool, and um, you know, they made me feel like family from day one. So it was, and I spent like a week and a half out there. So it was really really cool, and when I, I probably it was probably my first time spending Christmas outside of South Carolina, um, and that was dope too. I mean. To wake up on Christmas Day to 80 degree weather. I mean, you can't beat that. <laughs> oh, come on. Bro. Seriously. Yeah, man. Man. Yeah, man. In 1996, I was a sophomore at Berkeley High School in Monk's Corner, South Carolina. Okay. And man, I just those were some fun times too, man. Just chopping it up with my homies. Cause this was right around the time where Wu Tang was at their peak. So we were trading, mm. we were trading our Wu-Tang CDs like every day at lunch. We would go get our food. We get our little our little pizza and our fries. And we carry it outside to the courtyard. And we would just share our, we would share headphones with each other. And that old dirty album had a had us in a stranglehold, man. Golly. I was working. Yeah, man. I was working at well, I my, I was working at Kentucky Fried Chicken. I was there for all of three days because I just <laughs> I quickly came to the realization that food and bev just it ain't for me. And the man, I remember mm. the last day I was there, the manager manager pissed me off something serious, and I was like, I quit. And then that Denz, that and the Denzel came out of me. I was like, I'm leaving with something. So. <laughs> after, after we me and the manager got into our spat he went outside for a smoke break and while he was outside i walked back in the deep freezer and i took like two big bags of the frozen mighty wings and tucked them in my shirt and got in my car and left and wow. i and i hadn't been back to that kfc since <laughs> nor should you go <laughs> exactly <laughs> But man, so I um just thinking about 1996. Some of the things I tell you what, we'll start with some of the um two key inventions that dropped in 1996. The first one was the Motorola StarTac phone. Mm. You man, listen, I remember my uncle Virgil. He's an attorney, and he was the first person I ever saw that had that StarTac phone and kept that kept that clamshell on his hip. And I thought that was the, that was the co- I thought that was the coolest shit in the world, man. Because I was so used to seeing right. the, no- the like the Nokia brick phones with the green display. I never mm-hmm. that was the first time I ever seen a phone that actually that actually closed. I was like, man, I want to get like him one day. Just, I'm gonna be a lawyer so I can get me a StarTac mm-hmm. phone. I mean, obviously, I was caught up in the moment, but man, do you, do you right, remember right. the StarTac phone? I remember it vividly, man, because it cost an arm and a leg. <laughs> I didn't have one. I didn't get a cell phone. You know, Danny, I don't think I, I got a cell phone. Pro- I didn't get a cell phone probably until uh, another three years in 99 uh, when our oldest son was born. I know I had a cell phone at that point. Yeah. Um. But, yeah, I was I bet at that time it was, you know, most people had pagers. Or I'm, I don't want to say most. A few people had pagers. Uh, once, we, once I got out of college um, and I started moving around, and I moved to Atlanta in '97. Uh, I had a I had a pager, and so I kept a a, a, a ashtray full of quarters, you know. So you had to pull over and and uh, call the people back or whatever like that. But I remember that phone vividly. Not a lot of people had them, uh, and like I said, it was going to cost you. I want to say those phones might have cost like a G, maybe a little bit more. Yeah. But um, they were very expensive. But I mean, if you had one, like like you said, your uncle, trust me, it stood out. It stood up because not a lot of people have. Yeah. True story, man. And I think I was in the same boat with you. I don't think I got my first cell phone until like 99. And then mm-hmm. the other thing that came out of 96 that took the that took America by storm had so many people acting so stupid during the holidays was Tickle Me Elmo. Mm. Man. Wow. Just the, the the news clips of seeing people just rushing in these department stores on Black Friday just to pick up this this damn Elmo that talked. I mean, it wasn't like it had any other magical powers or it performed any tricks. It just talked and like shook whenever you mm-hmm. touched it. Yeah, man. That what do you remember about Tickle Me Elmo? 
I remember the frenzy. I really remember the frenzy, man. It, it was, like you said, Black Friday. And Black Friday back then was truly Black Friday. All of the stores shut down on Thanksgiving. And so you you know got a chance to spend time with your family. You watched the NFL, uh, the Cowboys and the Lions. Uh, and back then, that was the only that was the only time you got Thursday night games, yeah, uh, or Thursday games in the NFL because there was no such thing as Thursday Thursday football. Um, and so that was the thing; like people wanted this doll, and it literally is a doll. And if you know, if you're familiar with the character Elmo, in my opinion, Elmo has like one of the most irritating voices that you could ever hear. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing about it was was that it was. I think it was just the fact that so many people wanted it. And I think after a while, Danny, it was so many people wanting it. Then you had people trying to get it and they really didn't want it, but they just wanted to be, they, at that point, I don't think they wanted to be the one that didn't have it. Right. Right. So that was the thing that everybody was buying for their kids. And like people, I mean, and I'm pretty sure you probably could pull it up on YouTube. People literally were in stores fighting over Tickle Me Elmo's on Black Friday because in some places they weren't in, in they were in high demand but low supply. So and then you know after if you didn't get it like you know Black Friday, you know it was probably like another two or three weeks before some stores had them again, and people were I mean people just lost their mind. I mean like that's one of those phenomena, man. You you just kind of say like you had to be there because it was it was crazy. And I mean again. Elmo is an annoying dog. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I don't know what the appeal was. I just know that there was, you know, there was scarcity there. And sometimes when you have scarcity, uh, it can create pandemonium. And that's what happened. Indeed it did. And another, I'll tell you another, well, some other major news stories had uh, the mad cow disease spread in 1996. That had everybody mm-hmm. on edge. And what do you remember about the mad cow disease? I remember the mad cow disease because it was one of those diseases that uh, it was probably the first of what we would now call a pandemic. But it wasn't it wasn't so much of you thought you could catch it from anywhere because you had mad cow disease and eventually it was bird flu. And it was a couple of other ones in between before, you know, we got COVID or what have you. But um, the thing that I remember about it was that like it wasn't as much information. So there wasn't like a whole bunch of panic, but we really didn't know how you could get it or how you could get rid of it. So, you know, some people, and then it was, unfortunately back then the internet was just coming to, and it wasn't like the, like you could click a button like right now where you could get any information at the tip of your fingertips. Um, So there was a lot of misinformation. So it was like, I remember here one time, like, if you were on a farm, you could get mad cow disease. If you mm-hmm. ate, I mean, if you drank some bad milk, you get a mad cow disease. Yep. So it was like a whole bunch of stuff being said, and and nobody could confirm anything, nobody could refute anything. So it was just like you just kind of had to. And to be honest, Danny, I don't know anybody that got it. So I mean, like, me either. It was one of those things that it was mentioned, but you know, you really didn't know. One hundred percent. And another news article that. Well, another news uh, thing that happened in 1996 was John Bonet Ramsey being found dead in her basement in December of 1996. That also took the world by storm. And I just remember all of the, just the media coverage it got. It was, it was crazy, man. What, so do you, what are your takeaways from that whole, that whole ordeal? Man, they still talk about that little white girl. <laughs> in Bill. 2023, Danny. They still it, I mean the story is sad. Uh there's a bunch of conspiracies, a bunch of think pieces. People wore a bunch of think pieces and a bunch of interviews in 2020 and all of the talk shows. And I think I I don't think I'm out of place in saying that a lot of us who heard the news by the time it really, really spread and got all over the place. We were tired of it. Like we was like, man, okay, I'm, and and it's unfortunate because like, yeah, that little girl was killed, and I don't know if we'll ever know who killed her. But at the time, too, man, black people were going missing too, and I mean, like, nobody was caring, nobody was doing no documentaries, nobody was doing news stories. Period. 
True. on black people that were missing. So, you know, it was going to be hard for her to get sympathy from us because we weren't seeing or being shown that same level of compassion, um, you know, for our people who were missing or if stuff happened. I mean, because stuff like that, unfortunately, could happen. And it did happen. And, you know, it was, the news was non-existent. So I do remember the story. And like I said, in 2023, they still talking about that shit. You can make you can mention that little girl's name and there's somebody talking about it. There's a documentary or something like that. And people still have their ideas as to who actually killed her. Um, and I don't know if we'll ever find out. Yeah, I don't I don't think we ever will. And mm -hmm. lastly, with major news articles, and this coming off of the heels of this guy being charged, September 7th, 1996, Pac was shot in Las Vegas and subsequently passed away on September 13th. Man, I remember hearing the news that he got shot and I was like, holy smokes. And my mind immediately went to Suge. I was thinking, I know Suge has something to do with this. That's, I mean, that's all I could, that's the only thing I could come, the only conclusion I could come up with, whether it was well thought out or not. And I remember the day that he passed away, we actually got the news in church. The preacher actually wow. brought it up. Really? Yeah. And I remember sitting in the pews with some of my friends and he looked at us. And of course, you know, old black man, he's going to butcher his name. He called him two box Shabu or whatever his name is. That's what quote unquote. That's what he said. He said, Y'all keep straying away from God. Y'all going to end up just like Tubac. Mm. I was like, wow. Okay. You know, the, the, the news reached the pulpit of all places. Mm -hmm. So um, what were your biggest memories from the, that ordeal? Man, a lot. Um, and I'm, uh, let me start by saying I'm, I'm, I'm a fan. And I, I, I was a fan from Tupac. I was a fan from, you know, probably the first album to apocalypse now uh, because he was raw and he was militant. He wasn't the death row Tupac. Yeah. I mean, if you follow Tupac and you understand his discography, there's the Tupac before he went to jail and then the Tupac after jail. Mm -hmm. uh, Tupac was a very complex man. And if you think about it, and I mentioned this um, on my podcast, Tupac's run really, if you think about it really was probably like from 95, 91, to 96 so he really had about a five-year run and danny i'll be honest it doesn't feel like it was that it felt like it was way longer than that yeah um but um i remember you know hearing that he had gotten shot and this is again you know we don't have the internet so the news is coming sporadically um you know so when we heard that he got shot on you know leaving a tyson fight we didn't know the details surrounding the fight we didn't know anything. We heard that Suge had gotten shot too, um, which has never been proven. They said he got grazed by a bullet, but I don't even know that there's any anything that shows that he was ever ever hit. Um, and so that happened. And we just, you know, we thought, okay, well, he'll be okay. And I mean, like the days passed, and I remember like, because Pac got shot and then he died, I think on, it was Friday the 13th. I want to say like that Tuesday, the reports were, that he was awake and he was talking and he was feeling better. That's what the reports were. Now, I don't know how true that was because I don't know if he ever came out of the coma that he was in. Um, and then when they dropped the news that he had passed, I was working at a video warehouse in Orangeburg, South Carolina. Wow. And, and I remember what happened was we used to play, we used to have a radio at work and I went outside and came back inside. When I went outside, a Tupac song was on. And when I came back inside, another Tupac song was on. I was like, that's weird. Because, you know, radio stations don't play artists back to back like that. Mm -hmm. And at, when I heard the second song, I was like, man, why? I was thinking to myself, like, why are they playing Tupac? And then the guy, the DJ came on. He said, you know, tragic news. We want to pass along. If you haven't heard, Tupac has been, um, he has succumbed to his wounds and he has passed away. And then he hit us hard because, like, nobody expected him to die. Like, yeah. we didn't know the severity of it. I didn't know that he had been shot. You know, he had gotten hit six times. And Tupac had been shot before. So we were like, you know, Pac, gonna, he going to be, 
He going to get shot. He going to get out of the hospital. He going to make a record about it. He going to cuss some people out and it's going to be it. <laughs> and it really hit us because this was the first time that we had lost a rapper like this due to murder. It wasn't, you know, Trouble T-Roy having a, an accident. It wasn't, you know, some of the other rappers who, who had passed away. You know, this it wasn't Easy e who passed away from AIDS. This was Tupac. And I mean, at the time, he was arguably the biggest star in hip hop, period. So that's like, if you think that Drake is the biggest star, imagine somebody just murdering Drake on the Vegas Strip and nobody don't know nothing. Yeah. You know, it was, and that was the thing too that really bothered us, man, because we were like, how could you get murdered or how could somebody get murdered on the Vegas Strip after a Tyson fight? This wasn't like a random Tuesday night. This is after the Tyson fight. And, you know, we had heard word that Suge told his people, like, don't say nothing. Because allegedly the death row people were in a convoy of cars. And so this other white cat, this white Cadillac pulled up and started shooting into um, Pac's, uh, I mean, Suge's BMW. Then Pac got hit. Um, but, you know, it it hurt us, man. And I mean, like, it hurt hip hop. It hurt us fans. And, you know, that's why if you talk to some people like, for some people, I'll be honest, Danny, particularly hip hop fans, it's hard to talk about. Biggie too, you know, as far as like that time frame, because it was a lot of stuff that happened that didn't need to happen. And, you know, even in them arresting, you know, at the time, I think it was last week or earlier this week, they arrested Keefe D. Keefe D has long said that he was in the car. So, you know, he was in the, he said he was in the front seat and allegedly his nephew was the trigger man and his nephew got killed, I think a couple months after pop. Um, but long story short, we we hurt. We were really hurt. And like I said, as a fan, um, it still hurts because it's like, I wonder what Pac would sound like now. You know, because yeah. Pac is, he's older than me. So he's, Pac would have been, he would have been, he would be, I turned 51 um, in December. So Pac would be, he would be 52 now. So he's, he's, he's a little bit older than me. But I wonder, especially his thoughts on policies and the political climate. Yeah. And, you know, how would Pac have would Pac have supported a Barack Obama? You know, would Pac have called out a Donald Trump? I mean, like, it's a lot of and then even in, you know, because you're a fan, rap wouldn't have been the same if Pac, you know, because it, it's some people that came out. Yeah. You know, and flourished that wouldn't have been around because Pac would have called them out. So it's tough, man. It is. And like I said, as a fan, um, you know, I, I don't mind sharing my stories and, and, and I've done that on episodes and talking about Pac and Big. Um, but it's 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 still bittersweet, man, because they took him out and you know they didn't have to. And it's just um that was it was an awakening for us because we had never lost a rapper like that, and then we lose Biggie, what, six months later. Yeah. And that was that was that was a devastating blow too as well. So it's it's um it's really bittersweet when you when we when we think look back and think about it. Yeah, man, a legend going mm, way far too soon. Far too soon. Mm-hmm. So and much like you, everybody remembers where they were when they got the news. Everybody yep. remembers. And I want to keep it in the music wheelhouse. So there were quite a few great hip hop releases that came out in the year 1996. You had AT Aliens. You had Reasonable Doubt. You had Iron Man. Just um, you had Riding Dirty. Man, so what what were uh, what were some of your favorite albums that came out during that time? Um, man, you I mean, and I know you you going off the top, but I mean like from Reasonable Doubt to the Fugees, uh, Tupac's All Eyes on Me, Illadelph Half Life by the Roots. Oh yeah, um, yeah, that and that's like what that's prop that might be my favorite album, not the best. But my favorite album from that year, um, Hell on Earth, Mob Deep. Um, what else? The Coming, Busta Rhymes. Uh, let me see what else. Like you mentioned, Iron Man, uh, Tribe Called Quest, uh, Beats, Rhymes, and Life. Yep. Can't forget about Nas. It was written. Yep. Stake, um, stakes is high. Stakes is high. Day La. Uh, Pac again. The Don Illuminati Seven Day Theory. Uh, Red Man, Muddy Waters. Oh my uh, God. <laughs> Helter Skelter, Nocturnal. I mean, <laughs> bro, you had the Lost Boys, uh, Legal Drug Money, um, Foxy Brown, Il Nana. Um, man, it, it was just like, and I, th- I think I might be forgetting one or two, but 
Um, and you mentioned AT Aliens riding dirty. Uh, I mean, bro, it was that year. A lot of people think it's the best year in hip hop as far as albums. I think it is a very close second to 1988. Um, if you oh, Lil Kim Harker, I forgot about Lil Kim with the oh, with the, the album cover, the, the infamous poster. I wish my mom, I wish I would hang that up in my house, man. Listen. No, I don't think nobody hung it up in the house, but you could not go in any dorm at South Carolina State University and not see that that hanging up on somebody's wall. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, man, it was um it, it, that year. I mean, I I could make a case. I mean, I, if you make a case for 1996, I'm not going to necessarily argue because those album, all these albums that I just named, and that's only half of them. Those were killers. I mean, 88 is I think the greatest year in hip hop. And I think 96 is right behind it. 93 and 94 have great albums, but they're top heavy when you start you know, moving down a little bit. But um, I, I think it's they're not as strong. But I mean, like, even something like um, Firing Squad, M.O.P., uh, Enigma, Keith Murray, they aren't yep. the best albums, but they're not up with the albums that we just listed. So um, I, I'll put it like this, Danny. I bought a lot of CDs that year, bro. You and me both. <laughs> you and me both. I bought a lot of CDs that year. Jesus. Matter of fact, I think the first time I heard Elevators, oddly enough, was the day that I quit KFC. <laughs> I was drive. I I was driving my mom's Astro van, and mm-hmm. I was heading back home. And the local radio station was a Z ninety three Jams, and they do yeah. the top the yeah. top nine at nine. And like before, like in between the number two and the number one song, they they normally like will have the song of the week or like a new mm-hmm. song that they break. And it was and it was elevators. And just hearing that because it was such a hard, like such a hard turn from like the player shit and like the mm-hmm. the knock like the knockingness of the beats, yeah, off that were on Southern Playalistic. I mean, it felt like. It felt like I was on drugs the first time I heard it because I'd never heard it. Like it was just slow and deliberate. Mm-hmm. And just the, the hypnotic chorus. I'm like, bro, what am I listening to? Yeah, man. I mean, I think it threw everybody for a loop because they was they was they was used to seeing the, the player stuff, you know, everybody was bankhead bouncing. They're like, now nah, mm-hmm. we're gonna slow, we're gonna slow it down for this thing. Right. And and, and the thing about that, I'm, I tell people all the time, like. It's such a polar opposite from Southern Playalistic. And then, you know, a couple of years later, you get, you know, Aquemini. Those first three albums, even though it's the same group, you see the 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 growth in both Dre and Big Boy as far as their rhymes. You see the growth in them as, as young men. And you see the growth as far as, you know, for somebody like Dre fashion. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Dre, <laughs> I tell the story all the time, Danny. When that elevators video came out, you remember Dre had the turban on, right? Yeah. Man, two weeks after that video came out, you I went to the club. Man, it was dudes in the club with turbans on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, man, come on, man. You you ain't never wore no turban in no club. Now you up in here because you seen the Dre, you seen Dre and do it in the video. Mm-hmm. But that's well, cast, man. They inf- influential. Yes, 100 percent And then there was another radio station we had down here in Charleston called WPAL, which was actually the first black owned radio station, mm-hmm. RP Rhythm 100.9. And they used to have mixed shows every Saturday night. And okay. I remember, and it was either on Saturdays or on Sunday nights, they would take an album that was coming out that Tuesday and they would play that whole album in its entirety that Sunday wow. night. Wow. And I remember they, they played Reasonable Doubt and man, I was at manifest. I was waiting, <laughs> I was at manifest that Tuesday, waiting for them to unlock the door to open the store so I can go in there and get my copy. Yeah, man. Boy, oh boy. And I that's the man. thing I, I tell people about Reasonable Doubt. I, I as much as I love that album, there was only a few people that really, really was on that album when it came out. Um, for as great as it is, and as great as and as important it is to Jay Z's discography and his legacy. Um, people weren't really checking for Jay because nobody knew. And and again, we didn't have the internet. So um, when the albums came out, it was word of mouth. You mentioned, and you and I talked about, you know, going to Manifest uh, Record Store. In in a scenario like that, you'd go to Manifest, you'd buy that CD, and you'd play it. I wouldn't know anything about it. But what happened was you'd come to school or come to class and be like, yo, man, 
you heard that Jay Z yet? And I'd be like, no, nah, who is Jay Z? Oh, he's the dude with the ain't no song. Oh, oh, for real? Okay, hey, get his album. And I, I might go buy it, or I might just, you know, go to your house and cop a dub, you know, whatever the case may be. But yeah, it, it was that was an album that was it was a slow burn. But once people caught on, Jay took off. Absolutely. And then riding dirty. I'm not gonna lie to you. I was a little late to the game on riding dirty. A lot of us were. Same here. I was too. Yeah, but it wasn't until God, I don't think I heard riding dirty until I got to college. And one of my best one of my best friends in college was from to he was from DeSoto, Texas. Shout out my okay. dog Brian. Okay. And he was the person that really introduced me to a lot of the, the Texas rap. And he was like, yo, check this one out. And I was like, yo, this is this kind of jamming. <laughs> it was like one day came mm-hmm. on, but boy, that next song, that dog on murder. Man, listen, Bun dumped out on that one. <laughs> Bun lost his ever loving <laughs> mind. Yeah, man. Bro. And then uh what was the, what was the song that came on after that? Pinky Ring. Pinky Ring, yeah, yes. Yeah. Pinky Ring still jails, man. Still jail. You ain't never seen no out of uh, 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 clean <laughs> boy. And pimp just he just brought such a, a, a man, just a, such a jazzy element of musicality to his production that I think is doesn't get the credit that it deserves. No, I don't think people realize how talented Chad Butler was until he was long gone. Yeah, that dude was talented as all get out, man. It, it ain't even funny. And I think a lot of stuff that he did. Cause he he did he did he not only ghost wrote but he also ghost produced for some other people outside of UGK man mm-hmm. extremely talented man that he he was another one going way too soon yeah man and then <clears throat> talk about stakes is high I remember yeah. seeing the I remember seeing a video for that on Rap City and I was like yo because it had been a minute since they since they put out an album Mm -hmm. I think it was probably three years three years yeah and that's a long time in in music yeah since they released Balloon Mind State I didn't even know that they were working on a new album I was watching Rap City and then they had the video and I'm like bro this beat is knocking Mm -hmm. and Jerry Stackhouse is in the video I'm like (laughs) I'm I'm buying this album too right sight unseen yeah man so man what do you have do you have any uh takeaways from the stakes is high album. Oh, definitely. Um, it was one that um one stood out to me because this was their first work without Prince Paul. Good point. Um, and you know, so you know, even then you weren't really sure. Uh, but back then we didn't really care who was who was you know behind the boards or whatever like that. But it wasn't until it wasn't until I actually bought the album and I started reading the liner notes and I didn't see Prince Paul's name on it. That's when I found out. It wasn't that somebody told me, but um. That album was very, I mean, the title track, that album is very critical. Uh, I did an episode on that uh, when it celebrated its 25 years, I think. So I think that was last year. Um, and that was fun doing it, me and my man Eclectic. And, uh, but yeah, Stakes is High. Because De La is one of those groups, man, just same with Outkast, consistent, consistent, consistent. Yes. You know, and they, I, I re- I'm, I'm glad that their music is on streaming now because really back then, like if you didn't get their music, I mean, you just didn't get it, you know. So, man, but that album, front to back, man, that's a cold ass album. It is a cold ass album, and it's one that I still love listening to, man. Still Me love too. listening to to this day. Me too. So, lastly, the album I want to talk about is what the one that you previously brought up. Your mm-hmm. personal favorite album of nineteen ninety six, Philadelphia Half Life. Man, listen. That album has never left my rotation. <laughs> so if I had if I had a, the, the the twelve disc change in the back, it would still be in there. I mean, that out and it, and it's so different from their previous album. Do you want more? Um, but that album gave you everything. It was Black Thought. It was Malik B. Man, yes. rest in peace, Malik B. And you know, Quest Love. As far as how they arrange the music. Um, the album flows, the guest features don't, you know, overshadow the music, um, from Q-Tip to Common. Um, I, I, I just, that is a, an album again, even to this day, Danny, when I put it on, I just, it just play. I just let it play. I mean, like from the start to finish, it it is, 
it is incredible. And I remember um, my cousin put me on. He was like, the first song I heard was Clones because I heard Clones like oh, he he I think he had like a maxi single or something like that. And he played Clones for me. And I was like, yo, who is this? He's like, man, it's the roots. Because I actually I heard this album before I heard Do You Want More. So I had to go okay. back to Do You Want More okay. and Organics. Um, and I fell in love with it, man. I fell in love with it. And I bought the CD just I bought the CD just off the strength of clones. And then I think maybe a week later the video came out for clones. And I was hooked. By then I was hooked. I had been learning the words and everything, man. And, and the roots uh from that point on was one of my favorite groups and still one of my favorite groups to this day. Man, I remember the first time I heard clones, I was half asleep <laughs> on my on my parents' couch. It was like two in the morning and MTV was on. And I forgot that I had the TV on. And then all of a sudden, the beat comes on. The... I was like, <laughs> groggy, wipe, wiping my eyes. I'm like, yo, who is, the, is the, that's the roots? Mm -hmm. I was like, bro, yeah, I'm I'm copping this. One of the biggest things yeah. I remember from Illadelph Half-Life, well, one of them is, one of, the, one of the selling points for me is the fact that they got four and a half mics in the source. Yes, yes. Which in some cases can also can honestly can be more valuable than it being five mics. Mm -hmm. And another the other takeaway from it was the fact that Questlove said that his aim as far as his drumming was to sound as close to a drum machine as, as he possibly could. He did. <laughs> I still don't believe he's playing that song uh, It Just Don't Stop. I still refuse to believe he's playing live drums on that because ain't no that's this sounds straight up like Chris Love is one of the best drummers ever. I it, it's him. It's him, man. That dude is he's incredible. Um that album, man, like you said, it 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 just really just goes and flows. And um, you know, it it didn't sell the most records or whatever like that, but um, like I said, it for me, it was just and it and it didn't even contain their biggest single single, which was You Got Me, which was on the next album. Um but yeah, it, it's man, I I love them dudes, man. Love them dudes. And I I love the the cohesiveness and the yes. flow of the album. And just it ebbs and flows. It's like there's peaks and valleys. There's no not every song is an oh shit moment. No, 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 no. Even with um uh push up your lighter with uh Bahamadia. Yes. Um I mean, like like I said, I mean, she's from Philly and she just fits in. It that like I said, that album is incredible. Matter of fact, I'm gonna I'm a, gotta put it in tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, me too. Same, same. <laughs> yeah, ninety six still get a lot of play in my ride, bro. Still, it, all the joints from ninety six still get play in, in my ride. Same here. So now I'm gonna I'm gonna switch it over to sports. Now mm -hmm. this this is the last thing we're going to cover. So just some of the highlights. So January twenty eighth, Cowboys beat the Steelers in the Super Bowl. Man, I know Charleston was acting. So stupid on that day because honestly, Charleston ain't nothing but it's, it's half Cowboys and half Steelers fans. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I remember on Sundays going to my friend's house and all of their uncles and, and older cousins would be in the back all liquored up <laughs> talking shit to each other. And I mean, they do it to each other every year. But the fact that these two teams actually played each other in the Super Bowl that year. That was a sight to behold because I'd never seen such high level niggatry. <laughs> that I mean, it was like medical grade, bro. Yes, <laughs> that, that was a sight to behold, man. So, do you you remember anything about this this uh this Super Bowl? Yeah, and, and I'm I'm about to I'm about to hate. So let me just let me just fair warn your um <clears throat> your your fans out there and your listeners. Uh, I'm, I grew up a Giants fan, diehard Giants fan. So I hate the Cowboys, right? So I hate everything about the Cowboys. Uh, ironically, I married a Cowboys fan, but I still hate the Cowboys. So this Super Bowl is, is, is key because this was the last time that Dallas was good. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Dallas bang, ain't bang. been, they ain't, bang, been good, they ain't been good since Tupac was alive, since Clint was in office. I mean, where's the lie? Hey. Shots fired, but where's hey. the lie? Hey, you know what? That's a lot. I mean, so <laughs> this is, the, but you know what? In all fairness, I, I, I could be honest with, with the Cowboys nation. Um, those who stuck around this long, hey, y'all die hard. Because 
a lot of people would have got off that narcotic a long time ago. Which I'll still on it. So, you know, but um, you know, I, I think the reason why Charleston, where in that area where you are, is is uh Cowboys fans and Steelers fans, because if you think about it, particularly the generation that's a little bit older than you that was in the sixties and the seventies, well, particularly the seventies, those were the best teams. Yeah. Cowboys. I mean, those are teams that won Super Bowls. Cowboys and obviously the Steelers won seven, excuse me, um, four in ten years. And people have to understand in Charleston, Monk's Corner, Somerville, that area, there's in well, just even in the state of South Carolina, there was no Carolina Panthers, right? So when you turned on the TV on Sundays, uh in the 70s and 80s, there was no Sunday ticket. So you got, you know, pretty much on the you you pretty much got the national game. So whatever the national game was, normally what they showed in that part of the country was uh for for the NF NFC. You'd see the Cowboys, you'd see the then Redskins, um, and that was pretty much it. And then for the AFC, you see the Steelers or you see the Raiders. Every now and then you get Miami games because of the proximity of, you know, Charleston and, you know, to Florida and Miami and what have you. Um, even though they're not close, but they're, you know, whatever like that. Cause I mean, nobody was nobody was watching Tampa Bay. <laughs> so Absolutely you know, at least, not. At least in the <laughs> at least in the seventies and eighties, you had some good Dolphins teams. So that's why everybody in your area and particularly, like I said, that generation, a little bit older than you and probably on down, they were, you know, Cowboys and still you in your area. You probably got the same as what we had in Florence, Cowboys, Steelers, Raiders, Redskins. Yep. Yep. That was it. And then, you know, baseball, it was the Braves because the Braves and the Cubs, because they were on uh, the Braves were on what uh, W PBS. CBS and then the Bra- the Cubs won WGN. Same for the Bulls. Even before, you know, Jordan came, you know, you got a lot of Bulls games on TV because of WGN. And then we grew up baseball wise. A lot of people in our area were Mets fans because of uh, WOR, which was uh, the super station that showed the Mets games. And you perfectly uh, transitioned into what the next sports topic, which was going to be. June sixteenth, the Bulls beat the Sonics in six games to mm-hmm. win the ninety six championship. And for me, I was a diehard Sonics fan growing up. That's how I'm an really? OKC. Yeah, okay. that's how I'm an okay. OKC fan okay. now. Makes sense. Makes sense. So those two previous years were a tough pill. Those were probably the most, the worst sports moments of my life. Particularly the ninety four season where the Sonics had the best record in the league. Yeah. And losing the first round to the first round. Denver Nuggets. <laughs> the Kim Bay Matumbo. I could not t- oh my God. Oh Matumbo embracing the ball. <laughs> I can't get that out of my mind. That and then the following year, they were the two seed in the West and got knocked out of the first round again by the seven mm-hmm. seeded Lakers. The the Dell Harris Lakers. And for two years, I could not talk shit about anybody's yeah. team. I had my, my homie Gerard Ransom was a Detroit Lions fan. I couldn't say nothing to him. <laughs> Every time I tried to pop shit about the Lions, shut up, Seattle. And I just had to, <laughs> I just had to tuck my tail and, and, and take the abuse. Yeah. But they redeemed themselves. Mm-hmm. Man. And I mean, they made it a respectable series. I think they were up, the Bulls were up 3 nothing. Yeah, Bulls up 3 0. And I was like, boy, oh boy, I'm about, I'm about to get it again. And then. Sonics rattled off back to back wins in game four and game five. I'm like, okay, I, I'm I'm all right with that. I'm I wasn't expecting them to win, mm-hmm. but the, again, they they made it a respectable loss. So, what were your biggest takeaways from that one? Uh, I think the Bulls took their foot off the gas. Honestly, um, Jordan or Pippen will probably never admit it. I think they touched on it a little bit during the last dance, um, but I think the Bulls mentally took their foot off the gas. Because they won pretty convincingly in games one, two, and three. Yeah. And uh, Gary Payton said, <laughs> I, know, I know you're familiar with this. Payton's the glove said, you know, that he went to George Carl, the head coach, and said, hey, put me on Jordan. And he put him on Jordan. And Jordan's scoring average went from like 35 to 23. I mean, he still got 20. I mean, even if he averaged 23 in those two, loss, in those two losses, it was just, I think, Mike having bad games. I don't necessarily know it was because the glove shut him down. But um, it was, I mean, it was, 
you you weren't going to beat the Bulls in a seven game series. I mean, it just no Jordan just he just he wasn't going to let it happen. And I'm not just saying it because I'm a huge fan. It just wasn't going to happen. And Seattle had they they had a squad. I mean, from Hersey Hawkins to Sean Kemp to the glove, Gary Payton, uh, Def Left was on the team, right? Yep. OK, Um, Sam, Big Sam Perkins. Yeah, I'm not mistaken. Big smooth. Um, yeah, big smooth. So any other year, man, I think they would have got it, man. But, you know, they couldn't. It, they, it just wasn't going to happen. It just you, you were in the way. And Jordan kept a lot of Hall of Famers from getting rings. And they just they were they were some right there. That's a good point. And then the next month, July 19th, was the start of the Atlanta Olympics. Mm. Man, so many memories from that one. Yep. I think the first memory was, bro, why in the hell did they have Muhammad Ali holding that torch, man? Well, they had to because Ali had become the symbol. Um, but it was also, it, I remember watching that live. It was also scary, too, because it, the way the camera was positioned, it looked like Ali could actually fall into the flame. Um, but it was also bittersweet, man. Ali, Muhammad Ali is one of my favorite athletes. Um, and in my opinion, he is the GOAT. You know, he 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 he's definitely the GOAT. But, you know, America, white America didn't really embrace him until he couldn't talk. Yeah. You know, or or he was a, a shell of himself mentally. And, you know, so it, it while it was a level of happiness and a level of pride to see him up there, it was also like, okay, well, we can now we can let him represent the country now because, you know, his his whole career, you know, he 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 was he was, you know, vilified of his political stance and the stuff that he was saying about us as a people trying to uplift us. So um that was bittersweet. I remember that and I think the other big big takeaway other than the the bomb um was the uh Michael Johnson yep uh running the 200 I think it was 1912 or something like that when he ran it in crazy 19, 1932 okay yeah 200, 200 and the 400 mhm yeah and the 200 and the 400 he was he was he was killing it um and then obviously the the bomb that happened in uh Centennial Olympic Park um which was crazy and I wasn't here at the time I was still in Orangeburg and I moved in the summer of 97 and that was still the talk, you know, but I will say this much that Olympics did so much for the city of Atlanta. Um, the city damn near exploded uh, between the Olympics and freak Neek, There was a whole bunch Ooh. of people like me who came down and just put our put our flag in the Atlanta soil and never left. Man. And I remember if you're talking about Michael Johnson, honestly, he's he's my all time favorite track athlete. Okay, okay. And man, when he came, when he got in the starting blocks and I saw them gold spikes, I was like, oh, he yeah, he's he's about to get this job done. Yes, yes. And it was him. And um, if I'm not mistaken, I think uh, Antoine Maybank won the gold medal in the 400. I want to say he's mm -hmm. from jo he's from Georgetown. Okay. Wow, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, I think there's actually a highway in Georgetown named after him. Small. I have to ask my wife about it. My wife's from uh, Andrew, so I gotta I gotta ask her. Her her people from Andrew. So no kidding. Yeah, yeah. That's she. She grew up in uh, California in uh, Compton. And okay, you there? Yeah. Okay, y'all yeah, was saying when we got married, we got married in uh, in Andrews, had our reception in Georgetown. No, what? Yep, small world. Wow, <laughs> Andrews, yep. home, of, home of Chubby Checker and Chris Rock. Yeah, Chris Rock, <laughs> and Chris oh. Rock. Chris Rock was only born there. Like he was born there. He was there for like three hours or something like that. But he's born in Andrews. Yeah, old Highway Forty One boy, mm -hmm. Williamsburg yes, County, Williamsburg County. And uh, lastly, October twenty sixth, your New York Yankees. Beat the Braves yes. in the World Series. So what was what was that like for you, man? That was that was pure joy, man. It is, I think everybody. I mean, idealistically, you would want every fan to experience watching their team win a title. I don't care what you know. You you mentioned the Sonics that being your team, and now OKC, okay, you want to see them win a title in your lifetime. 
And to have that happen, and given the fact that I didn't, I don't like the Braves. For us to beat the Braves as a Yankees fan, man, it, it was it was so sweet. I, the only thing could have been sweeter <laughs> is if I were physically in the city of Atlanta at the time. But um, yeah, man, it, it that was and that was our run. You know, that was the core four, and um, you know, guys like Jeter, you know, became you know larger than life, really. Uh, and you know, as a baseball fan, you never forget those times when your team wins and those rosters and and those you're always you're always so happy to see those guys um you know whether it be Tino Martinez or uh, Mariano Rivera anybody from those teams you always so happy to see them man because you know the work that they put in Joe Torre um and, and it's it's always a good feeling man so that was that that just even thinking about it man it just brings back a smile <laughs> on my face man it brings back a smile on my face Man, that was that was something, man. Ninety six, man, that was a hell of a year, man. Hell of and a year. Pre- appreciate you being on to, uh, to go back to go back down memory lane. Man, thanks again for having me on, man. Um, I got to get you back on the podcast. We had a great time. Yes, we did. Uh, breaking down black on both sides by most deaf. Um, I don't really. I'll be honest. I don't really pay attention to numbers, but when I looked at the numbers that's been one of the highest rated shows that I've had this year. And really? um, yes, yes. No wow. lie. And man, we, we go, you guys come to my, my, uh, my page. Um, we did it and it's right at about an hour, man, but it, it felt good. And you even going back and watching the episode, uh, you were bringing up some things about the album that I had totally forgot. I was like, Oh man, I forgot about that. And um, so, yeah, it, it was fun. It was fun revisiting that album. And it made me go back and listen to it even more, man. And uh, so, yeah, we definitely got to, even if it's sports or music, man, we got to get you back on, man, so we can chop it up again, man. That was fun, for real. For I'd, real. I'd be honored, man. I, I felt oh, like man, I, you know, I'm going to get you back on. I felt like I made it when I got I got the call. <laughs> I was like, man, he got it. He's like, yeah, let's get this lefty out the bullpen. I'm like, all right, <laughs> let me run out this bullpen real quick and see what I can do. Yeah, man, we had, we had like I said, you know I'll get you back on. That ain't no thing, bro. Absolutely. You know, the door is always, doors always open for appreciate my podcast. It, appreciate folks. it. Appreciate so, it. So thank you all for listening. Make sure you like, download, and subscribe to Since We Last Spoke with Danny Foxworth. Make sure you like, download, and subscribe to the 12th Kyle Podcast. He puts out new episodes every Thursday and bonus episodes on Sundays. There you go. And make sure you follow the YouTube channel. I'm at Danny Foxworth 843. 12th Kyle is at 12th Kyle. And for 12th Kyle and myself, This has been another episode of Since We Last Spoke. And until next time, y'all be good. Peace.